Empire. How long before the games come back? That's the question of the day, or the week, or the month, or the year. What's up, everybody? It's Mike Jones. This is the Football Jones Podcast. Thanks for coming back for another episode. You can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ByMikeJones. And as I said, we're discussing this world where the sports world is just on pause. And my guest of the day is Adam Kilgore of the Washington Post, who wrote a really interesting article talking to a lot of experts about when they thought sports might come back and how long we'll be waiting. So without any delay, let's get to our talk with Adam Kilgore. And uh, here we are with my buddy Adam Kilgore from the Washington Post. He had a really um, intriguing and depressing story uh, this past weekend about the prospects of when sports will return. So I wanted to get him on here to talk about it, to talk to a lot of people. Um, Kilgore, how you doing, bud? We're hanging in, man. Uh, yeah, we're, we're luckier than most. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the invite, man. It's good to, good to see your face on the Zoom meeting we got going and yeah. uh, have, have you chat with you. Yeah, I actually has some contact with the outside world you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. through a computer screen. Yeah, so, I mean, the big question I think that everybody is always asking is when everything is going to get back to normal. Um, and here we are, um, and just nothing, there's no, like, light at the end of the tunnel yet. And so I just, if you could just give kind of a summary a little bit about what you learned in your reporting on your story on, you know, how much longer we could be without sports. Yeah, I think that's probably a two-pronged answer. Number one, anybody who says with anything approaching um, to being definitive about like when sports are going to come back is kind of full of it. You know, there's so much that we don't know about, number one, the virus, the disease, um, what the restrictions and the measures we're taking, what effect they'll have on mitigating the disease, what medications could or could not be available uh, over the summer months. Um, even, even, you know, there's debate um, or sort of uh, curiosity about like, will the higher temperatures in the summer have an effect? Um, some people are hopeful that'll be the case. Some people don't think that the um, coronaviruses operate like the flu as far as being seasonal. Um, so anyway, there's so many variables that we don't have um, and questions that we don't have answers to yet. So that being said, I do feel like um, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be sooner than later um it's part, partly because when there, there's unknowns um because you, you sort of have to be cautious um and the, the possibility of sports being uh gone and not coming back for quite a long time is is real um just because of all the variables and factors i, I think sports are going to be one of the last things to come back um just as they were really one of the first things to go away um just because of the nature of of those events. Um, even if you try to host games without fans, um, there's still a lot of complications, you know, yeah. uh, and we can get into some of those details later, but like, it's just, it's not as, uh, that's definitely an easier said than done kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that this is, uh, I think other countries are even seeing this. And a great example is Japan where they seem to have things under control. They were going to play, uh, start their baseball season with no fans. Um, three players on the Hanshin Tigers tested positive for COVID-19 and all of a sudden they had to push their season back twice and now there's no start date. Um, so they were, you know, that seemed to be a country in a league that had things under control and had things going the right direction and now there's still more uncertainty and there's no, there's no game. So, you know, that we could see that here for sure uh, where it seems like everything's getting back to normal and then there's um, a spike that affects sports uh, is the sort of second wave that a lot of doctors um, are expecting um, would, would definitely push back any, any possibility of sports happening. Um, and and the, the biggest thing is too, I, you know, the, the worst possible outcome that we could have, not just as like a sports world, but like societally, the biggest tragedy, 
tragedy would be if we took all these measures and flattened the curve and did what we could to sort of combat this um, and doing that, you know, had such a drastic effect on our economy and people's lives. And then we, you know, pulled the Deshaun Jackson, dropped the ball to the one yard line and get complacent. Yeah. And it was all for nothing because we, we picked them too soon. So I think that's the, that's the problem that sports faces where um, it's going to, one, it's going to take a lot of steps, you know, that we're going to have to like get people back to work to a certain degree. Uh, we're going to have to relax with travel restrictions and all those things have to work first before, before sports can come back. Yeah. It's very layered. It's very, um, like you said, there's not a, a real concrete answer because we don't know. Um, but you know, we listened to the NFL last week and, you know, in that conference call, Jeff Pash, the executive vice president, um, you know, and general counsel was like, all of our energy is focused on planning to get the season started on time. Um, and I understand from a business standpoint, you have to say that you've got, you know, season tickets and corporate sponsors and you know, broadcast partners and everything like that. You want to convey confidence. But then the next day, Dr. Stills came out and, you know, said, yeah, kind of backed off of that a little bit for the NFL. Um, and so it just kind of feels like they're, they're over-optimistic um, to think that. And then you also wonder, okay, do they actually really believe this? Um, but, but, as far as the other sports that you've reported on, they are they are affected by it right now, um, and that's the thing that's so much different. You know, as the NFL is, they're kind of just looking off into the future and hoping. But like baseball and the NBA, um, it's really hurting them right now because they would be in, in hockey and college sports. You know, it's just it's right now. Yeah, I don't I don't blame uh, the NFL for being hopeful. Um, because just like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's possible that there will be, you know, you know I, I think it's definitely possible there won't be sports at all this, this whole year or before there's a, there's a vaccine, which hopefully is early 2021. Um, that being said, you know, we know so little about this disease that, you know, that, that also leaves room for hope. Um, I, I do think the NFL was probably a little, uh, overly confident, overly certain in, in how they projected their views going forward early last week. I think Dr. Allen Sill sort of walked some of that back with talking to uh, Judy Batista at NFL.com. So I, I do think, um, I think they, the NFL seemed to me like they realized probably that they had, had probably um, expressed a little too much confidence in the season starting on time, when, when the, especially with no restrictions. I mean, he said that they weren't even talking about, um, you know, possible con contingencies, which strikes me as right. um, – not realistic, <laughs> um, but you know, even even though I mean that that's it's interesting though. I mean, it's hard to even, you know, I think the idea of like you know, people, the NBA is talking about doing like a you know a quarantine tournament in Las Vegas or the Bahamas or something like that, um, and that's a uh, you know, in theory that that sounds good and makes um, makes some sense. But um, I I I question and I wonder how workable that's going to end up being, um, just because you're talking about there's a lot of issues one you have to sort of um you're talking about like controlling the lives of a lot of a lot of grown men uh both players coaches staff everybody you know um so you know are, are you going to ask like for daily or weekly medical records about who they've come in contact with and do you want medical records from those folks um are you going to be testing you know on a daily basis that raises a lot of thorny questions i mean we've already had a lot of debate and it's, it becomes a little bit philosophical but there's been a lot of debate about you know are um people with means and people who, who are celebrities getting uh, advantageous um uh, access to, to tests already now you know maybe who knows in, in a couple of weeks or a month hopefully um some of these like like the abbott machines that they're working on like you know those will that'll make testing easier and more widespread but you know even by try to say like training camp will those tests be limitless? Because if, if they're not, you're talking about taking like, I don't know, I'm trying to do the quick math. It'd be like, say you want to test guys like at the start of the day, right, um, right. at the end of the day or before practice and after practice to make sure that nobody has, has COVID-19. That's like a training camp, you're counting staff and everybody. That's like a conservatively like 6,000 tests every day. So yeah. there needs to be like, I guess we have to decide one, uh, it'd be great if like, you know, because of what, what, 
whatever machine is available that maybe tests are effectively limitless and that's feasible. If not, then we have to like really prioritize sports to, to devote um, those resources to like testing athletes and coaches and stuff. So, um, you know, I, I, again, like hopefully it's, it's possible. Hopefully it is an option to play without fans, but the, the prospect of having, you know, like 1700 NFL players and, and more during training camps and um, none of them uh, catch the coronavirus, um, you know, if there is like a second wave during the summer or early fall, that seems really unlikely. And we saw what happened with the NBA when one player got the coronavirus, I think rightfully so, the entire sports world shut down. So, um, you know, I think there's just a very high barrier to to clear um, to get sports back. And we just don't know, you know, sort of even how to like start climbing up that ladder. Yeah, I mean, and like you said, there's so many questions. So like, you know, normally when somebody gets the flu, um, you know, that guy, you know, is out with flu-like symptoms and everybody keeps on practicing. Um, you know, and, you know, the guy comes back in a day or so or sometimes plays with the flu, you know, and has, you mm-hmm. know, an epic game or, you know. Um, yeah. And, but this is different. And, I mean, those questions are like in everyday life too. Like if we're at school and like your kid, somebody in their class winds up getting the coronavirus, you know, this September, is school going to close down again or is it just going to roll on? Um then the other question, you know, about playing without fans, people say, oh, I can just play without fans. But that's a lot of revenue right there as well. So eventually mm-hmm. these sport teams are going to, I mean, I know they make a lot of money off of broadcast um, partners, but still, like, that's revenue that's going to be lost there. Um, and I just wonder how that impacts them, the millions of dollars that they would be forfeiting off of those season tickets packages and concessions and all that stuff and everything like that um, in comparison to the whole piece of the whole pie. And not to mention too, you're talking about, that's a lot of local economies and like little micro economies in, in all these cities too of concession workers, you know, you know, people who are working the, the stadiums, um, cleanup crews, like, they're, they're, I mean, you like when you go to a game, there's, you know, a, you know, probably a, I mean, even probably four figures of like just people who get to work, you know, right. uh, security that, that aren't, aren't working and there's no fans um, and wouldn't even be able on the premises. And also there's, a, I think another pretty good question too, is like, you know, everyone talks rightfully so about like the psychic effect that having sports back would have on the country. Um, I think it would be really uplifting. It would be um, certainly like the bit as I think when, when sports went away, that was the biggest signal that like there was a real crisis here. And I think when they come back, it'll be, it'll really herald like the return of, normalcy and, and normal life but if you're playing a football game in an empty um gillette stadium or whatever um does that is that really back to normal you know is that really going to have like the sort of uplifting effect that we want and we believe sports can have um you know given where the country is now so i think that's a question that has to be asked too is like what you know it'd be, it'd be great um yeah i mean it'd be you know for you know guys like us we like watching sports like uh it's like it'd be great if we could turn on an nba game um at night and it would be great if the leagues could salvage some of their um tv money you know and and um hopefully that trickles down to a lot of different other other parties but um you know i think that's that's one reason why like i the sport i'd be really worried about is college football because Mm -hmm. you have the the first step you know the the that sport has hurdles that the NFL doesn't face because you have to have students back on campus to play college football. There's no, there's no just, there's no way they could justify, you know, having like a training camp and, you know, out in the desert or something, if you're Alabama, like it's not going to, that's not going to happen. So they, they need a lot to go right to get college football going, especially on time. Um, because you know, like, like college campuses filling up again will be one of the last things that happens, probably. That's just so crazy to think about that. This is that there's so many layers to the sports world that you know we kind of take for granted. Um, and like you're saying there, you know, getting students back on campus, um, and 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 then how do you test those? Like they don't have the budgets that NFL teams do, so testing all of you know football players and things like that, and. I mean, and then even as you're talking about watching, um, you know, those sports again, even like I'm not a wrestling guy, um, but, you know, last night, you know, Rob Gronkowski wins and, 
you know, it was just weird. Like he's like holding up the belt and everything. And there's like no cheering going on, you know, like yeah. the whole atmosphere. Um, you know, you, you don't realize how many, how much fans add to the atmosphere um, of a sporting event. Um, and I know those guys would go out there and play, even if nobody was in front of them, but it's just, I, I don't know um, if playing without fans will just really push this thing along as much as like we would hope it would. I'm trying to think of it like the best way to put it. And I think that's why I said before, it's like you want, you know, the whole point of sports training is for to f- feel like we're back to normal. And it's, like, it's, it's almost going to be like a reminder of that things aren't normal if you're playing without without fans. Um, any, any, I don't think, I think too, like it's pretty telling, like when you look back to how things unfolded in early March when every, when sports like one by one started getting canceled. Um, I mean, every league and every conference seemed to go through this process of saying, okay, like we're now going to announce that we'll have no fans in our arena. Right. And before they could even, I, I can't remember, maybe the Mac men's basketball tournament did this or women's basketball, but I, I don't, there, there was like almost no leagues that actually did play without fans. So I think they came to the realization pretty quickly that like, oh, well, if it's unsafe, if it's unsafe to have fans in the arena, uh, it's actually kind of unsafe to like have, you know, 50 players and referees and who, you know, staff and whatever. Like, it's not like, you know, the, the barrier of like, what is a safe gathering? Yeah. It's pretty low. So I, I think the, the thing that you, I think that leagues already ran into when they started to sort of cancel events is that, you know, it's definitely safer, obviously, to not have fans, but is it safe? Um, that, that's a different question and we'll have to figure that out. But I, going back to what you said, you said like about, um, you know, like the idea of like, yeah, when you have the flu, sometimes you like go to work or, you know, you go, you know, you, you, you like still play sports if you're sick. I like the, the best reason to be hopeful would be that, you know, there are, um, according to one um, doctor I talked to, there, there are like drug trials going on that um, uh, the WHO was running that they're trying to sort of develop, um, whether it's like an antiviral type of thing, you know, sort of like whatever the coronavirus's version of like Tamiflu would be to put it in very simple and probably not quite a thousand percent accurate terms, but you know, for like practical purposes, like a, a drug that can treat that, it, it, you know, just to mitigate how sick you get and how likely you are to die from the coronavirus. And if that works and gets in, in and it gets proved quickly and can get up to production quickly, um, you know, I mean that, that would have drastic effects. You know, you you that that might help. Um, you know, go if people go back to work earlier. In theory, you would not stress the um, the health system enough, and you could even you could start discussing like, okay, like is this something that we can live with? And that means you can start saying, is this something that we can, you know, get our sports leagues going again? Um, now I think there's a lot of ifs. I think that um, it's okay to hope, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bank on that. But that is like, you know, that's in, in the very, very best case. Like every like our logistics works, we get some kind of drug that you know, helps matters. It wouldn't be like a panacea, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a vaccine, but it would be something that might help and might sort of nudge society back to getting where it was. So that's the sort of like best, most rosy scenario. Um, I wouldn't bet on it. I mean, the worst thing, Jonesy, like the biggest picture, like one is the, the next time that something in this crisis makes you say, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, we'll be the first, you know? So I, that's like sort of a grim way to look at it, but that's just that's just the facts right now, unfortunately. Now, who was the most optimistic person that you talked to and who was the most pessimistic? Like, and what was their stance and what was the most pessimistic stance that, that you talked to? Yeah, so the, the most optimistic was um, the doctor... He, he used to work at, he has a really long title, but he, so his name is Ali Khan. He used to work at the CDC um, as a director of one of the departments there. And now he's at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Okay. Um, and he's like, you know, basically an infectious disease expert. And he, he was pretty bullish that, um, you know, I mean, again, he wasn't, he was, you know, I think he, he had a good line. He said, my, my crystal ball is not cloudy, it's black. So he wasn't, you know, saying like, well, here's how it's going to, here's how it's going to happen. But he was, um, he, he was, probably the most optimistic and, and presented the sort of most optimistic possibility, which would be one, like he, he was talking, he was talking about those, the, the, the drug trials, the fact that um, the WHO is working on certain medications that, you know, with, with lock in, uh, you know, could be available by late summer and could have a real effect. Um, again, it wouldn't be like a vaccine, wouldn't be a panacea, but could really help 
um, sort of, you know, mitigate the effects. Um, and he also mentioned he, he believes that if the second wave does come, that our healthcare system would be much better prepared. You know, there wouldn't be as much chaos and scrambling for ventilators. Um, doctors would sort of, you know, have a, have a better idea of like what to expect. Hospitals would be a, a better idea of what to expect. And um, they would be better prepared with hopefully um, supplies um, and that it wouldn't be, if a second wave did come, it wouldn't be as catastrophic, it wouldn't be as catastrophic as it feels like right now because the country would be better prepared and the health system would be better prepared. Um, so that, that's a nice way to look at it. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's hopeful and it seems reasonable. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that even, even for him, I mean, he's, he said, he was, he said, look, yeah, I definitely think it's possible that there are going to be football games, especially without fans in the fall. And so it's definitely, I don't want to be too doom and gloom here because, you know, I think that the, the best point to make is that is uncertainty is what we're looking at. We're not looking at a definitely not or definitely yes. Um, most pessimistic was probably, he wasn't pessimistic. He was very, I think he was very rational about it though. It was um, a guy named Jared Evans. He's a researcher at Johns Hopkins, um, works a lot with like modeling and that kind of thing. And and his his main point was, was you know, to get our life back to normal, what you need is, you need a lot of testing and you need to sort of get to a point where the infection rate is not just leveling off, but going down. Mm -hmm. And that just takes a very, very long time. And that's like step one. And that, that would mean, you know, that, you know, you're talking about once you get to that point, then you can have people at work at their computer six feet apart, you know? Um, and he made the point too, that you have to be cautious. You can't, you, you can't like send people back to work and then say, oh, sorry, that didn't work. You, you know, whoop, whoops, we screwed up. Uh, people are getting sick again. Because one, that's terrible for, for public health. Um, and it's going to make more people sick. And number two, it really erodes public trust. And I think uh, one, one thing about um, like public policy, you know, public health uh, ethics, you know, people in that world, um, the thing that they would stress most is like you, you cannot, uh, like, you know, once you make a decision, you have to know it's going to work because if you start walking it back, um, that's just it's terrible for public health and it's terrible for um, the way people view their leaders and and public trust. So that would be that'd be a disaster. So I think that 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 need for caution too is definitely going to play a factor in like how fast sports can come back as much as we all would would want them to. <laughs> well. Like I said, intriguing but depressing. Um, yeah. What do you think, Jones? Are you are you are you feeling hopeful right now? I, I really don't know. You know, yeah. every single day I just like am asking myself if this is actually real. Um, and <laughs> I just there's so many questions. And then I look at those some of those models in the charts, and you say it spikes in May and then goes down in June, then levels off in July and August. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe so. But then just figuring out everything on how they decide if they let fans back in and all that stuff and all the testing and everything. There are just so many questions. So I can't even begin to, you know, like if we're talking about like high school sports and stuff like that, I can see, but like the, the pro sports leagues and college sports, I, I just, I don't even know. Um, I know. And I mean, the other thing too is like, it, it's not like, um, you know, it, it's not like it, like it, it has to be eradicated or, you know, under control in every part of the country. Um, you, you can't start an NFL season if, you know, most of the country is back, but the, you know, places in like the NFC South or NFC West or wherever, like it's got to be gone everywhere. Cause if it's, if it's anywhere, then it's, it could be everywhere. You know, I mean, the, the right. amazing thing is awful. You can, the, the Giants don't have any home games or something like, do the Knicks not have home games for a while? I yeah. Mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's feasible because it's like, that's how saying like, oh, well, it's, it's okay. Uh, would we'll just take the Knicks and put them somewhere else. Well, like that's how you that's how you spread it. That's how you, yeah. you know, especially with college. And again, that's why like college football is going to be even tougher because there's just so many schools and so many possible hotspots. Yeah, yeah. There, there are just a whole lot of questions. That and every part of the country is on, on a different timeline too. I mean, like even if it's like starting to peak, if we're pushing the peak, say in New York, you know, there's parts of the Midwest or the South that aren't going to peak for. A, a month likely from what you read and from what experts say so but even that is a projection you know even there's so little data that even the best models are, aren't that reliable i mean the smartest people in the world are only as good as what data they have and we still don't have that much data that, that's yeah. kind of a problem 
And then you also have different leaders and decision makers, whereas, you know, like you could have, you know, the California governor who was like, I don't see it in my state. And then, you know, in some other state where it's not as bad, could be like, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know, so how does everybody come to be on the same page? It's, I don't know. Just totally. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean, yeah, we didn't even, you know, probably mercifully so, but we didn't even get into like the, some of like more, the more political ramifications. Right. I mean, because you're going to have certainly like, I mean, I, I can't believe this is happening, but it definitely seems like, uh, you know, states with like um, Republican governors are like less likely to have restrictions and states with the Democrat. I mean, it's like mind boggling to me that it, it could be a political issue, um, but it seems like it is. And like, okay, so then if you're Roger Goodell or you're Adam Silver, like, how are you like going to juggle, juggle that? Like, do you listen to the government authorities? Do you listen to your own public health officials? You know, I mean, like the Ivy League, for example, you know, it's certainly a smaller sports organization than the NFL, but like they were ahead of, they canceled their tournament before the Massachusetts governor declared an emergency. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're like, what is another sort of philosophical question that we could spend a long time talking about, but like, if you're Adam Silver, do you have a greater, a sort of greater like moral um, or ethical uh, responsibility to play or not play even beyond what the authorities are telling you, what, what government officials are telling you, um, you know, do, do you have to like sort of consult your own health experts and, and what and listen to what they say? Because even some health ex experts are and could be split just because like we took talking about the lack of data. So there's like, yeah, there's, there's a million things to consider. Um, but we, I mean, the best reason I hope that sports are back is that it means that um, it only happened if people stop getting sick and that's what we all want the most obviously exactly we want real life for everybody to be <laughs> yeah well Kilgore I really appreciate your time man um tell everybody where they can find you washingtonpost.com slash sports uh Adam Kilgore WP on Twitter all right good deal hey thank you so much um and uh keep keep your family uh safe and healthy there and uh, I'll talk to you soon yeah I love you buddy be thank good you. All right, so there you have it. Again, nobody really knows the answers to these questions. We're just kind of taking this thing day by day, watching it as this plays out. Hopefully something good takes a turn for the best and everything gets back to normal sooner than we expect. But again, we just don't know. I hope you guys have a great week. Um, Thanks for listening. Again, you can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at by Mike Jones. Um, I will not have an episode next week. I'm going to be off next week, but we'll come back the week after that. Do me a favor. Take this link. Share it with your friends. Go on there. Give me a review. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks.